be seated. Father, may I speak with love about the one who is love. Amen. Our readings today all center around the image of the suffering servant, the suffering prophet. Ezekiel is called to preach in vain to the rebellious house of Israel who will throw him into briars and thorns and seat him upon scorpions. Paul, after beholding the heaven of heavens, is given a thorn in the flesh. And Jesus, who is not just a prophet who claims to proclaim, thus saith the Lord, but who is himself the very word of God in flesh, is rejected by his own kith and kin. The sort of hero celebrated across the Bible is the person who knows God intimately and suffers because of it. I think for today, I'd like to focus on the example of Paul. Paul tells us today first about his mystical vision of God's face, but then also, and, and more importantly, about how he suffers alongside Christ. So first, the ecstatic vision. Early on in his ministry, Paul was graced with lots of revelatory visions from God. In fact, that was how he was converted to the way of Jesus while he was on the road to Damascus to persecute Christians. And now, all these years later, he's an established apostle, but troubles surfaced in the church Paul planted in the bustling Greek capital, Corinth. Paul is being challenged by a rival group vying for leadership in the Corinthian church. These arrogant men whom Paul mocks as huperlian apostolon, so-called super apostles. So he has to peacock a little bit. You want to play the holier-than-thou game? I promise I'll win. So he tells them about the visions he was privileged to see. He says, I know a man in Christ more than 14 years ago, whether in the body I cannot tell or whether out of the body I cannot tell, God knows. Such a one was caught up to the third heaven. And I know such a man, whether in the body or out of the body I cannot tell, God knows and how he was caught up into paradise and heard unspeakable words which it is not lawful for a man to utter. Paul informs these super apostles that he has seen a vision not only of heaven, but of the third heaven, the holy of holies, the inner sanctum of God's throne room. So if the Corinthians should listen to anybody, it's to him. But even in the midst of this bragging competition, the way Paul talks, he's just falling all over himself. He's an eloquent man, but he doesn't know how to talk about what it was he saw so many years ago. Medieval Christians compared Paul here to a blind man trying to speak about colors. What we do here at St. Mary's is heavenly, but it's only our limited imitation of what Paul saw that day in the Syrian sun. What Paul experienced is perhaps better felt than spoken. Not too far into contemplating this reading, and we notice that we're ear deep in mystery. And then Paul turns to suffering to his thorn in the flesh. Now, perhaps you're like me, and when you hear readings at Mass about the suffering and pain we're called to as Christians, your chest gets just a little bit tighter, and you hold ever so tightly to that sense of safety you hope to protect. But when we come to a beautiful sanctuary seeking comfort, we're so often confronted instead with a summons to pick up our cross and follow Christ to Calvary. And that is precisely where Paul points us. At first, you think that the ecstatic vision of the third heaven must be the real show. After all, Paul originally says that the thorn in his side was just to keep him humble. 
But by the final line, Paul says that actually his suffering is the real jewel of his life. Paul is not proud that he's had visions. He's proud that he suffers with Jesus. Who else, like Paul, asked God to relieve him of suffering three times? Jesus. Jesus prayed three times in the Garden of Gethsemane for his father to let his cup pass from him. And yet out of love, he took up his cross and offered the obedience we had refused to. So you see, Paul is not proud of his revelatory experiences. Instead, he rejoices that he has the privilege to imitate Christ. He feels grateful that now his fundamental identity is a man in Christ. Paul has taken up his cross and followed his Lord, and he looks back and begs us all to do the same. But why? Paul says his enduring pain is the place where Christ's power rests. So much so that Paul has become convinced that when he is weak, then is he strong. And that's a wild claim to make, not just now, but especially back in Paul's day. Paul would have lived in a world where for most, might made right. Weakness was certainly not strength. And the great epics of the Roman world reinforced this. Homer saying, goddess, seeing the cataclysmic wrath of Peleus' son Achilles. And Virgil would muse, of arms and a man I sing. And yet this strange Jew from Tarsus is going around telling people that when he is weak, then is he strong. Paul did this because he believed Jesus had changed everything. Paul believed that the judgment had come early at Easter. In the cross and resurrection, God rendered his final verdict on sin and death. And it rendered all our certitudes concerning the cosmos and history untrustworthy. Even if the mighty empire of Rome and the powerful religious elite saw fit to reduce Jesus to nothing and condemn him to the death of a beast, God did not agree. God raised him from the dead. God's verdict entirely reversed that of Christ's judges. Easter reveals that divine justice is on the side of the particular, the rejected, the victim whom we are willing to offer up to the greater good. That means that the truest picture of the one in whom all things live and have their being, the highest resolution image of the love that moves the sun and other stars, is a Jewish peasant crucified on a tree. Jesus, the visible image of the invisible God, shows us what it means to be God in the all too human act of dying. In his full and total offering of himself back to his Father, giving God the love and obedience we've never been able to. This strange and stupefying reality knocked Paul off his horse all those years ago, and it sent him preaching it to anyone who would listen. And so while, of course, all the world's cultures and their wisdom assure us that suffering can be good for us, Paul tells us that Jesus makes all the difference. What does Jesus add to our suffering? himself. Suffering is no longer a stoic bracing against the odds. It's union with Christ. It's redemption of our broken world. 
the most difficult moments in our lives, the ones we fear and avoid at all costs, are our crucibles. They have the most potential to forge our souls into the shape of Jesus. The very things we run from, avoid, dread, medicate, and deny, hold the secret to our liberation. These unhappy times of great emotional pain have the potential, if we open to God in them, to transform us into grounded, joyful people. Meaning is not a function of success or pleasure, but of being connected to God. Life is hard, with or without God. But what's really hard, nearly unbearable for some, is facing the pain and suffering of life apart from God. So what, what was this thorn in the flesh Paul suffered from? Did he have bad eyesight? We, we know he had to write in big letters in his epistles, and the Galatians say they would have given him their own eyes if they could. Did he have a stammer like Moses? He recognizes that his congregations didn't find him terribly eloquent in person. Did he have a limp? Or maybe even was he gay, poor thing? Scholars have concocted all sorts of theories. But it's actually good that Paul doesn't tell us. Because it means that you fill in that blank with your own thorn. And I know you have one. You and I may not have visions of heaven like he did, but human frailty is precisely the point at which Paul's story and ours intersect. One needn't be a prophet to suffer. I don't know what it is for you, but, but you do. And I bet like Paul, three times, over and over again, you've asked God for relief. Uh, for Mother Teresa, it was crippling doubt. For Lincoln, it was chronic depression. You might say, the greater the person, the greater the thorn. I think of a, a woman named Annis, my grandma mama. My grandmother lived with us while I was growing up, and eventually she developed dementia. This brilliant woman had founded the library in our town and taught me how to read, and I was there next to her through her long decline as her brain slipped away. I watched as she was reduced to a vessel who could only contain just one pure emotion at a time. But so often that emotion was joy. At the realization that it was me or my daddy or aunts visiting her, at holding a new great-grandchild whose name she would never learn, at humming along with me to a gospel tune that somehow her brain still hadn't lost its grasp on. In losing so much, she still hadn't lost joy. She hadn't lost her ability to love. In her weakness, God was glorified. Now, I don't want to romanticize her or my family's pain, or of course that of any human being who knows loss and sorrow. And I don't think that necessarily God is the one giving us these pains. The Bible doesn't say everything happens for a reason, but it says that God works all things to the good for those who love him. I only want to say that I believe God redeems. God does something with our pain. We hand him crosses, and he gives us back empty tombs. If, like Paul, we are men and women in Christ, the deep caverns of our souls where pain lives can also become pools of light where the glory of God is reflected. I don't know how to make sense of it, and I can't say it coherently, especially if Paul can't. But 
Isaiah says that by Jesus' stripes, by his wounds, we are healed. And I believe. I too am a blind man trying to speak of colors, but I hope you can hear me. And so as one of our hymns puts it, even though the peace of God, it is no peace, but strife closed in the sod. Yet let us pray for but one thing, the marvelous peace of God.